This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Kathy Worthington. Welcome to our latest episode of Late Boomers. Today, our guest is Emmy-winning set decorator, Helena Sivilop, who has been working in television for over 20 years. Some of her favorite projects have included Perry Mason, FX's Legion, Showtime's Masters of Sex, and the show she won the Emmy on, ABC's Pushing Daisies. And I'm Mary Elkins. The Emmy is television's most prestigious award. And besides winning the Emmy for Pushing Daisies, Helena has received numerous Emmy nominations for her work on Masters of Sex and Perry Mason. She's been a governor of the Television Academy and a member of the board of the directors for the Set Decorators Society. She juggles her work life with family life and her love of dancing and painting. Welcome, Helena. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here today with you guys. And we're so happy to have you. We are. We'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you found yourself on this career path and whether you had mentors along the way, perhaps. Those are all really good questions. Um, I always say that it took me a while to figure out what I want to do as a career. And um, uh, almost as though I had nine lives leading up to it. Mm -hmm. Um, But I realized that each each job, each change just led me closer to finding the creative career that I finally ended up in. Um, I went to UC Santa Barbara, had a career or a degree in communications. I had absolutely no idea what to do with that. So I applied for a short program at the uh, Fashion Design Institute of Merchandising here in Los Angeles, which led me down the retail management path, which Mm -hmm. was okay for a while. Um, But from there, I was recruited by one of the men's retail companies that I had worked for. And I moved up into, into their manufacturing and wholesale division. Oh. I helped with uh, the overseas productions and I dealt with manufacturers in Korea and Hong Kong and with our design offices in London. Wow. And that was really fun. Um, but then I got laid off. <laughs> oh. They say that, you know, opens a new door, right? Mm-hmm. Um so from there, I got a really bad job working working in sales for um, a teddy bear exhibit that traveled to malls across America. Oh, oh my goodness! <laughs> two weeks for me. That's exotic. And I realized <laughs> I'm horrible on the phone. I never want to do this again. Um, <laughs> and then I did consumer relations for a food business and marketing in the health and beauty sector. And none of these jobs are anything I wanted to do, but what they did is they gave me some really good skills. And so I always tell people that no matter what you do leading up to where you finally end up, you know, you're honing your skills and you're, you're building a foundation. I mean, I learned all about purchase orders and how to manage my workload while working in clothing operations. And to that person, to that mentor, um, I'm so thankful because you're really, I use it every day in my job. Um, So anyway, after all these jobs, I knew I had a problem, which is that I was avoiding what I really wanted to do, which was to design or be a designer and be more creative. Um, At that time, somebody recommended that I start taking art classes. I took a figure drawing class and something just sparked in me. And I thought, oh, I do have something creative here. I think I'll build upon that. 
So I enrolled into the extension program at UCLA um, in their interior and environmental design program. And once I landed there, I knew this is where I wanted to be. I just absolutely loved it. And um, I wasn't sure if I was going to finish the program. I didn't, um, but it gave me a lot of tools for what I'm doing now, because as I was in school, I had the great fortune to work as a production assistant on a commercial. Now, if you know anything about production work, like yeah. the lowest paid job, often the hardest, and probably one of the more boring jobs on the set. Like all I had to do for the art department was open 50 boxes of frames and clean them. Oh my but, goodness. <laughs> but being on set, there was something about the energy there and just the collaboration that I thought, aha, uh -huh, this is what I want to do. And I want to apply everything I've learned in design school to this. Um, so it really opened my eyes and I was just hooked. Um, and uh, I love the idea of creating temporary environments um, that could mm -hmm. be anything, whether I'm doing a graveyard or a hospital or a mansion and everything in between current day or period. Uh, well, Helena, just tell our listeners what a set decorator does. Sure. That's a great question. So the set decorator, I always compare it to the interior designer of the film set. So I work with a production man, uh, designer. He and I basically design the set and I work alongside an art director. And the art director, would, well, that's actually something that I started as because I had drawing skills that I could apply to some of the projects I was working on. The art director basically uh, works with a construction team that person builds the sets, creates those environments. I then come in as a set decorator and I add all what I think is the fun stuff. I do the lighting, I do the curtains, I bring in all the furniture, um, I'll bring in a jewelry box and stuff it with jewels. Oh, I will, wow. you know, dress out all the kitchen cabinets. So when the actor goes in there, there's a fully stocked kitchen. I go down to the small details to the ashes and the ashtray because I do a lot of period shows. Um, <laughs> and um, that's to me where the magic is. I love taking what I think the character is or what I've learned through our meetings and interpreting it through design. How does someone become a set decorator? Uh, well, that's a really good question too. Um, there's, you know, there's many ways. Um, some of the people I work with have a theater background. Some mm -hmm. of them have an architecture or interior design uh, background. Some of them have no design background and just come in and wing it. So really with no prep and education? Well, so let me go back to how I got my start. Maybe that'll help mm -hmm. clarify yeah. and then I could build upon that. Um, so I had worked on this commercial, but I had nothing else to go off of. I got a few art director names from my brother. And he basically said, you can give them a call, but they know that you're just a design student fresh out of design school. Um, so I don't know where that's going to lead you. He's and But he gave me the sage advice of just volunteer to work for free for a day. And so that's what I did. I called each person. I said, hey, I would love to either shadow you or volunteer my time for a day. Uh, that way you can meet me, know what skills I have, and um, just go from there. And on, this, on the same term, I'm learning from them, being uh -huh. on their jobs. I'm soaking up their environment and um, kind of seeing how things work. So that was my first introduction. And that was really a great way for me to do it. So I called both guys 
I gave them the same spiel and I ended up working for both of them for a number of years on various projects. Perfect. And wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I was you would, really thankful. That's what you would advise people to do that are trying to break in, provided they've got some skills already, right? Because yes. you had skills. You had amazing skills already. So what I always tell people is um, if you don't have anything, start learning, um, educate yourself, um, go to art shows, go to museums, um, take a drawing class, uh, study furniture design, you know, do all these things because then you're going to have all that information in your toolbox that you can pull from. Uh, I am more apt to hire somebody who knows furniture periods than somebody who doesn't just because it'll be more helpful on mm -hmm. the show. Um, so educate yourself however you can, um, find a mentor. Um, I have people who shadow me every once in a while. They come, they spend the day with me. They can kind of learn the ins and outs of being a set decorator and, you know, 12 hours, they're worn out at the end of the day, believe me, yeah. but it's a really great opportunity to learn, right? Yeah, that's terrific um, advice. And, yeah, and it's, you know, it doesn't cost anybody anything except for some time. Um, there are a lot of different programs if you want to enroll, um, like the UCLA program, the extension program. Um, and, it's just amazing what they can offer in extension. There's yeah. so many versions of that within yeah. the extension program. Yeah, well, it's great when advice for I people. Started, sorry, when, when I started out, um, they didn't have interior design programs uh, as readily available or any classes about set decoration. Now, um, Chapman University, the Institute of Design and Merchandising, um, uh, there's a few other schools that actually offer classes on set decor, which is great. That's great. They can graduate yeah. some accomplished people. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. 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 So uh, talking about set design, you, you did mention that um, you're very interested in working with people who know periods of furniture. What goes, what's the thought process that goes into decorating a set? A set? And what kind of research do you have to do when you're working on a period piece like Perry Mason? Uh, you know, research is probably the, the key component to having a successful design look. And we do gobs and gobs of research. And whether it's me doing it on my own, which I do a lot of, or often we hire a research assistant, um, you just have to immerse yourself into that period. I always say I would love to have, be able to time travel. Because yeah. <laughs> it is, isn't it? When you're doing that, when you're decorating right? a set of, that's in a special period. Yeah. And that's, and that's kind of one of my interests too. Like I like social history versus political history. Mm -hmm. I like to know what people, um, how they ate, how they bathed, what they used, what what was their furniture, what were the smells like? You know, you walk out in the street, you're getting a horse poop all over your dress. You know, how do you clean that? <laughs> like that mm -hmm. fascinates me. Um, mm -hmm. So doing period work is actually uh, something I just love. So we do a lot, a lot of research. Um, there's so many different websites that you can pull information from. UCLA has an extensive, ex, extensive catalog. Um, Calisphere is the, I think the UC, overall UC program that um, you can go online and just research anything. Uh, Library of Congress. Oh, that's mm. interesting. Well, how do you tell a story with your set? Well, we first start with who the character is. And then what's going on at that point in the script? And you try to tell something about the character in the details. Um, 
for instance, I did a, a kid's movie called Cheaper by the Dozen. I think it was a third or fourth remake that came out on Disney Plus recently. And the director wanted to really convey how chaotic their family life was. And the whole notion of lots of pattern, lots of color, those are the things that they wanted to just jump out at you to make it seem more hectic and, um, you know, no gray interiors, nothing soothing, but uh -huh. it was really fun. And it was also a little bit more like real life. They didn't want it too polished. They wanted it to look beautiful. Obviously it's a movie. It's going to be seen on a large screen or a large TV. <laughs> um, but they wanted to look like real life. So we had a lot of, a lot of set dressing, a lot of things tucked in corners. You know, when you have um, 12 kids or 10 kids, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know where they put everything, but we made it look packed. We used a lot of vivid colors and that said something about the family. Oh, that's, that's good. So that you, interesting. It's so good that you're able to work with the director like that because yeah. it would be kind of sad to completely have a completed decorated set and not have the director realize that those cabinets are full and he doesn't block it so that he's not utilizing what you've put there. Yeah. Have you had that happen? Well, yeah. And we've also had those instances where um, there hasn't been enough communication with the director or the writers and they don't really know what they want or how to convey it to you. Um, and sometimes your wires get a little bit crossed. So we try really hard to send advanced drawings, advanced photographs, design ideas. Um, and we also try to get them on the set before we shoot. Why don't you come on? We can walk you through the set. And once they're in the environment, they have those aha moments like, oh, wouldn't this be great if we had this over here or you know, I think the action is better suited if we move the couch another way. Mm -hmm. And so it's a real collaboration and That's it's great. ever, and it's ever evolving. That's oh, so great. I, I have to ask you though, about shopping for all of the things that you find for your set. How do you find period pieces, old like light fixtures and old Barbie dolls and Furniture, how do you find it? Where do you find it? I wish I could take all the credit, but I hire a really good team of people. <laughs> and um, it really takes a larger team for a period piece because you can't just order from Amazon or mm -hmm. go to Walmart or to Target. And you really, you really have to source it out. So we do everything from online shopping to prop house shopping. And here in Los Angeles, we have such a wealth of places. Um, I do a lot of Etsy and eBay purchases. Mm. Uh, they're mm. a godsend. And then um, I personally love going to antique sh uh, shops because mm. I like to touch it. I like to feel it. And sometimes I'm perusing through a store and I'll see something that'll trigger a design idea and you know we'll just build upon that one element that I may not have thought about if I hadn't seen it in person. So it's kind of a, a balance between online shopping and um, just going out and um, physically seeing with your eyes what's available. Mm -hmm. That's great. I wanna talk a little bit about the Emmys because that's very cool. Were you stunned when they announced your name when you won your Emmy for Pushing Daisies? I I was absolutely stunned. And um, that was our second time being nominated. And it was such an honor. It was just such an honor being there. Mm -hmm. Really, every time that happens, you're like, wow, I'm here with the top people who represent my craft. Well, Mary and I really want to hear some good Hollywood stories about that Emmy night that you won your Emmy. Well, I have to say that, um, so 
the night that I was, um, that we won, I had a three month old baby. I was exhausted. I barely had a dress that fit. (laughs) Uh, I barely got out of the door with hair and makeup done just by myself. And, uh, I just really, uh, wasn't feeling super amazing. Like, oh, I should be in front of the media. I feel fabulous. I wasn't, I was a tired working mom (laughs) and we were a small show that had just been canceled. And so we really thought that our chances were small to none to actually win. We were just happy we were nominated. And I think before the show, I even um, told another decorator who was sitting by me, I'm like, oh, I know your show will win. And then so I basically said, congratulations to her. And then as the night wore on, Pushing Daisy started winning in other categories. They won in hair and makeup, and then they won in costume design. And that's when I started getting really nervous because I thought, oh, people noticed our show. We actually made an impact. Mm. So I got really, really nervous. And when they announced our name, I just like popped up and I was like, oh, it's like almost screaming. And uh, the only, I went into mom mode. I was telling my crew, come on guys, we got to get up to the stage. Like, you know, just like herding cats because we were all just stunned. And they tell you like, you know, once your name is announced, you have to hurry up to stage right, and, <laughs> as fast as you can. And I was just like, come on guys, let's do it. And um, and the the funny part about that night was, that was all super great and glamorous and I loved being dressed up and I loved celebrating. But the best thing was, is I had to go home. I had to pick up my baby from the sitter and I have this fabulous photo of me just feeding my kid and the Emmy on the bed next to me. And I thought, oh, here I am. I'm just back in mom mode. I won an Emmy, but... <laughs> You know, what does it really mean? And I kind of felt like that's how my 13 years with my kid has been just oh. juggling the two. Yeah. Oh, a lot of working moms will love that story. Mm-hmm. For yeah. sure. Yeah, it was, it was really amazing. I would like to win again. No after parties for you. <laughs> no, no fancy after parties. You weren't out till 3 or 4 a.m., huh? No way, Too man. Too bad. I was so tired. <laughs> I, did you write a speech at all, or did you just go up there and wing it? There's very specific roles when you go up there on stage. Uh, only one person is allowed to speak for the group, and that was our production designer, and he had a little speech. He's just in case, and I'm so glad he did, because we were really just stunned and delighted. So, Oh, fabulous. Yeah, how how wonderful. What happened to your side of the industry when COVID shut everything down? Uh, That was really interesting. Um, Obviously, we can't work in person. I was out of work for about seven months, which stressed me out. Uh, And at that point, you know, if you're freelance, you always think I'm never going to work again, right? Mm. And um, but, you know, it's because a pandemic has hit. And there just wasn't work. So things were shut down for about six months until they got all the COVID protocols with all the various unions in place. During this time, we were really hoping that um, someone would have a uh, moment of reflection and maybe we wouldn't have to work 12 hour days maybe we wouldn't have six people in a tiny office. You know, maybe life could be a little bit more sane with after the shutdown. And um, it was actually the contrary where we went back to work and things were just a little bit more hectic. There was COVID protocols to follow. There was, um, they didn't always want you to come into the office. So you were trying to do all this work, which is a very collaborative career. You're trying to do it uh, remotely, 
um, carefully and um, quickly. And so it just added to our work day and um, there wasn't really a lot of accommodations. It felt like production just geared up more mm -hmm. as they tried to produce more content and um, it got a little crazier. And we um, still had those short turnarounds because everybody in the industry was hoping the turnarounds would get longer between days. Yeah. So but. on that note, so, you know, I think the actors were able to negotiate a longer turnaround time, which is great. And finally, and in, in, I think COVID helped this. Uh, we just had union negotiations recently. I don't know if you remember, but um, we went on strike. Our union, Local 44, went on strike for to ask for better working conditions. And one of the things we wanted was a longer turnaround time because for our, our local, we had an eight-hour turnaround. That means eight hours from when you finish shooting till the next day of shooting. So you have to commute home. You have to sleep. You have to wake up and you have to get back to work in those eight hours, which is a little crazy. It's totally so crazy. We were, it's nuts. Yeah. It's yeah. Nuts. So, and that's yeah. why people, they were so tired and they were kind of over it. Um, so we negotiated two more hours. <laughs> so we have a 10 hour turnaround now. Yeah, Still not it, ideal. It should be 12. Better. Yeah. Too bad it can't be 12 though. Maybe that's well, next, next always, contract. I always say baby steps. Exactly. Uh, you know, a lot of people wanted to push for a lot more changes. And sometimes I think you have to build on these little steps uh, mm -hmm. to get. There. So, you know, maybe next time we'll get 12 hours. That'd be awesome. Cause you're, I love my sleep. Yeah. Oh, you're very yeah. wise and you've got a family. So how do you juggle the long hours you put in at work with the family time? That is something that I have had to learn. Um, and I have um, sometimes not do, done as well as I hope to do. Listen, before I had a child, I could work endless hours. And my husband's in the career, in the same business, sorry. And um, so he kind of knew it and he got it. He's like, do what you need to do. So I was working really, really long hours. But there's something about becoming a mom that actually helped me in a way, even though I have another workload and all these other responsibilities and now, you know, juggling a, a teenager in school and all that stuff. Um, I just work smarter now. Mm -hmm. I, um, I say no. Um, mm -hmm. No, I have to go home now because I have family needs. And that's something that being a woman in the industry is sometimes really scary to say because you're working in a very male dominated industry mm -hmm. and um, people don't always want to make those accommodations. Yeah. But I feel like when you stand up and you kind of say like, Hey, this is really important and I can get my work done. Then people can see that you can do it. So, and the, and the way you get your work done is you literally have to ask for enough crew and surround yourself with really smart and talented people to hold you up. No one can do everything on their own. Um, and you have to learn how to delegate. And that was really hard for me because uh, I'm a Virgo. I want things to be perfect. And I have learned to let go of that and to let go of having to control everything and just have confidence that the people I hire are really good and they'll support me. And they always do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things don't turn out the way you want them to. Uh, and that's okay too. But they wow. have their own life, no matter how it turns out. Absolutely. And sometimes uh, you make mistakes and sometimes those mistakes turn into a really great design idea. <laughs> I've had that happen all the time. So we're like, yes, we're so happy, happy that happened. <laughs> well, how do you get the time to sing, to dance and to paint? Uh, well, dancing is my exercise. So 
Uh, I wish I could make it to the gym. Can't always. Uh, I try to make it to dance classes. That, of course, got shut down with COVID. Yeah. I'm trying to get back into that. You can do online uh, classes. But that's that's my exercise. I grew up dancing, and it's my... Um, what kind of dance? Yeah. Well, I started off in ballet. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I think ballet is a great foundation for any type of dance. Um, and then I went into modern jazz. And that's what I love. I tried hip hop, but this old white woman just doesn't move as well as she should. Hip hop is so hard and it doesn't look hard, but it's super difficult. Oh, yeah. my hat goes off to anybody who can execute those moves so well. Really, I wish I could learn better. Um, and then my next step is um, a friend group. At, uh, we're going to start salsa dancing. I think that'd be really oh, fun. Oh, nice. Oh, fun. That'd that's fun. great. Well, what about painting? When do you get that in? I don't. <laughs> Not much. And so that was something that came out of the pandemic. Um, I took a needlepoint and painting. I've always wanted to be a painter. I've wanted to be a painter since I was 16. I'm not there yet. I'm making a lot of mistakes. I'm self-teaching myself how to do watercolors right now. Um, I can work with acrylics really well. I haven't dabbled in oil paint. That's something I think I need to take lessons about. But those are all things that I feel open up the creative mind and kind of make me look at the world in a different way. Um, yeah, that's and, fabulous. And it just, you know, you apply all those things to your job also. I work with colors and then I take those and I think about those when I'm designing a set. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I wanted to ask you if you would please tell our listeners what a governor of the Television Academy does since you have been that. Yes, um, I've been involved with the Television Academy for about nine years. I started out first um, as um, a member of, the, of our peer group executive committee. And those people... Um, they basically help the governors um, decide certain policies. We vet Emmy entries. We make sure that everybody who uh, wants to get on the ballot is eligible and that the right people are being represented. Uh, and um, we just represent our craft. And that's so the peer group that I belong to is the art directors and set decorators peer group. And after four years of being a board member, I then was elected a governor, uh, which was great. And I've been doing that for the last five years. We got an extra COVID year because uh, mm -hmm. we didn't do a lot for about a year and a half. So does it have so, a term? It has yeah, a term it's, normally, yeah, it's normally a two-year term and then you get reelected. So you can do a, a total up to four years. But because of the special compensation, because of the pandemic, I'm on my fifth year right now. Great. And uh, it's been great. And so what we do is we, um, the Board of Governors, they represent every craft in the television business. So you have producers, you have stunt people, art directors, set decorators, costume, makeup, um, sound, lighting, you name it, I could go on. There's about 50, 50 some different categories. Wow. And um, we all just work together as a group to basically make things work for all the categories. And so that we're a cohesive group. And the Television Academy is just a dynamic place to be. They're um, at the top of leading, you know, with um, uh, leading the path for diversity. Um, they uh, do a lot of social media. That's fun. Um, it's a great place to meet people from different parts of the industry to network. Uh, you can be a member of their film group uh, uh -huh. and get a lot of screenings. 
and they're coming up with a lot of different ways of being involved. And one of the ways um, you also can be involved as a governor is working on different committees. So I have worked on the diversity and membership committee. And for the last five years, I've been the co-chair of the governor's gala and oh. that working oh. on the party after the Emmys. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's quite fun. a party. Mm -hmm. It is quite a party. Yeah, and we've that's... we've done that, haven't we, Mary? Have you? Uh -huh. We have. We've done the party. <laughs> yeah. And so you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it's such a fun design opportunity. I'm and um, they're always gorgeous with the designs of whatever they're doing. It's just yeah. magnificent. What are some of the designs you've done for them? Well, interestingly enough, um we had a change of venue my first two years. And so we had to completely redesign and rethink how this party would work. So we were no longer um, inside. We had to move it to um, the rooftop um, to an open air tent. And so it was an indoor outdoor party. But that was a really great design challenge. And um, I think the first year was like Emmy under the stars. And we had this beautiful light canopy that went the whole length of the tent. And um, and we did the same thing the second year, but just a different design, uh, but again, and then we were shut down for two years. Hmm. Um, and then this past September, we also um, had a different, uh, we had a change of venue and we were on the outside deck of the Los Angeles Convention Center. So it was a, a completely outdoor party, which was a new thing for us. Uh, but it was really a lovely party and so beautiful. And we work with a company, um, a delightful company called Sequoia Productions. Um, and between Sequoia and what the Television Academy and the governors want and what we can actually do, uh, we came up with a, a really great um, party, I think. Yeah, it's a lot of work. With all the tables and seating arrangements, and a and... huge budget, I bet. Yes. Um. Again, that's that's out of my hands. That is um the event companies. Um, mm -hmm. they tackle all of that, but we are definitely there advising, and um helping to shape the ball. Hmm. Helena, what would you like our listeners to have as a takeaway today? Well, I hope that. If you're interested in a career as a set decorator, uh, I hope you'll pursue it. It's one of those things that people don't even know very much about it. Um, as with many of the jobs on either a film or a television production, but I think it's great. So I always say, um, educate yourself on what's out there. Um, check it out. Call up somebody. See if you can learn more um, and then when you do find whatever place you want to be um, work really hard and sometimes you just need to have the time to learn your craft um, you might have to get somebody coffee or scrub chairs with a tooth brush for eight <laughs> hours which is what I did one day um, but know that the perfect job may not come overnight but it's really the long-term plan that you're working on. And um, one of the secrets I think of succeeding in our business is that just be nice. Um, you will shine out and people will want to hire you. Half the luck of getting a job is that people want to work with you. And they want to know that you're a team player and that they'll support you. It's a very collaborative environment. Um, and it's not always about how good you are um, because you spend more time with your crew. I call it my work family and my work husband than you do with your, at your own family yeah. at times. So, you just want it to be a really great work environment. So, and then just have fun. Yeah. It really find, find the joy in your work. I love oh. that. Thank you, Helena. 
Our guest today on Late Boomers has been Helena Sivilov, Emmy-winning set decorator, dancer, mom, wife, painter sometimes. You can reach Helena at the Society at, at the Set Decorators Society at setdecorators.com or at the TV Academy at emmys.com. Setdecorators.org. Oh, yeah, you're right. Setdecorators.org. <laughs> no problem. We want to remind our listeners also to follow us on Instagram at I am Kathy Worthington and at I am Mary Elkins and at Late Boomers. We always try to uplift and inspire you. So drop us a line on our website, lateboomers.biz, B-I-Z, and be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your play favorite platform. Thanks so much today, Helena. Well, thank you so much to the both of you. It's been delightful and a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers, the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to ewnpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact.